Good morning. Welcome to Grand Rounds. Everybody must still be at the academy. It got done yesterday, though, right? So everybody's no, coming back this morning. Gotcha. Everybody's recovering from academy, I guess. Um, so we got the last of our three visiting medical students today. Um, we're going to start with uh, uh, Romulo Albu Albuquerque. He's been working with uh, Dr. Ambadi here. He's a, he's a medical student at the University of Kentucky and works with Dr. Ambadi's brother, Jay Ambadi. Um, in his lab there doing work with, uh, who also does work with Bed Jeff. So we'll start with him. Um, after that will be David Gray, who's been working with Dr. Dries and Dr. Mamlis. Well, first, um, uh, Ramula will be talking about uh, a new member of the Bed Jeff family, and then David, Gray, uh, David Guy, rather, from uh, Virginia Commonwealth, who's been working with Dr. Dries and Dr. Mamlis, will present a patient, then anterior segment mass, a patient of Dr. Dries. Um, and then lastly, we have Stuart uh, Walther from uh, Texas Tech. He's been working with Dr. Teske, Dr. Dries, and he'll round us out talking about CMV retinitis. Um, anyway, I'll turn the time over to Romulo. So do I need to put the earpiece, or will people hear me okay if I talk mm -hmm. through this time? Why don't you stay by the microphone? All right. Well, good morning. Um, it's... Um, pleasure to be here today and uh, I'm very thankful for the opportunity to share with you some of my uh, research efforts um, that I have done in Kentucky. Um, I'm, uh, although I come from the University of Kentucky, I'm not a native of Kentucky. Uh, if you're wondering if I'm from New Mexico, uh, because of my last name, I am not. I'm a native of Brazil. and. Uh, some of the Brazilians in the audience can attest that Albuquerque is a very common name uh, in Brazil, very common last name. Um, but I hope to excite you, as I hope to get you as excited as I get about this uh, new VEGF receptor that I have found. Um, so the objectives of the talk today uh, is to review briefly the history of angiogenesis, of the field of angiogenesis. Uh, I also hope to uh, uh, define the two domains of angiogenesis and its molecular drivers. Um, and um, I'd like to share with you how this discovery of this new receptor came about and also uh, ta maybe show you some data that convinces you of the biological ro role of this uh, soluble VEGF receptor 2 and its clinical implications. Um, so I, you know, as in describing the history of angiogenesis, I could not not talk about Dr. Folkman. So Dr. Folkman published a paper in 1971 where he proposed that if we understood how to modulate the growth of blood vessels, we could actually treat cancer uh, and perhaps cure cancer. Um, and uh, his idea uh, was published in, the, in this New England Journal of Medicine paper in 71. And it's funny, if you, if you PubMed angiogenesis before 71 or at 71, you get like three papers. And I did a PubMed search yesterday on angiogenesis, and there are nearly 50,000 papers published in angiogenesis. So his idea has really taken off, and the 20 years following his the launching of his idea, uh, this field really thrived, and um, in this very short amount of time, we cloned VEGF, uh, we made knockout mice that uh, lacked um, VEGF, and we really understood vascular biology and how vascular endothelial growth factor plays a role in it. Um, and I, I enjoy talking to ophthalmologists about angiogenesis because you guys are really in the forefront of this transformation. You're really uh, practicing anti-VEGF therapy and seeing how many patients worldwide is actually benefiting from this idea of blocking blood vessel growth. So this is a, a table, uh, a figure from uh, the um, ANCHOR trial showing that Lucentis has really changed the way that macular degeneration is, is treated. But ophthalmologists also have a tendency to really focus on one aspect of angiogenesis, which is hemangiogenesis, which pertains to the growth of blood vessels and kind of neglect Lymph angiogenesis, and uh, I'm really interested in this aspect of lymph angiogenesis, and I'll tell you why. Um, so, molecularly, what we know is that VGFA uh, primarily drives hemangiogenesis through activating VEGF receptor 1 and VEGF receptor 2. Um, and um, it's actually VEGFA is the target of Lucentis. Um, on the other hand, we have a cousin molecule known as VEGFC that drives lymph angiogenesis by primarily activating VEGF receptor 2 and VEGF receptor 3. Um, and uh, this field was um, um, rev kind of revolutionized with the discovery of uh, soluble VEGF receptor 1 by Kendall and Thomas in 1993, 
Uh, these guys uh, show that this molecule is a splice variant of VEGF receptor 1. Uh, it's a very powerful uh, inhibitor of VEGF A, hence it's a very powerful inhibitor of hem angiogenesis. Um, our laboratory, in conjunction with uh, Bala's laboratory, we actually showed that uh, soluble VEGF receptor 1 is uh, expressed in the cornea, and it's singularly essential to maintaining the cornea devoid of blood vessels. However, the concomitant absence of lymphatic vessels in the cornea is really not well understood. But while I was working in this uh, paper um, that we published about soluble VEGF receptor 1, I actually made an observation that when looking for VEGF receptor 2 in the cornea, instead of finding the 230 kilodaltons band that corresponds to the full length VEGF receptor 2, what we found was a 75 kilodaltons band in the cornea, which led us to ask the question, could this be soluble VEGF receptor 2 just like soluble VEGF receptor 1. And uh, so we devised this hypothesis that there was a truncated form of VEGF receptor 2. And I've done some homework in gene analysis, and I actually showed that this truncated form was very likely to be a splice variant of VEGF receptor 2, uh, the full length VEGF receptor 2. So I continued to do my homework and actually cloned the mRNA uh, cor that codes for soluble VEGF receptor 2. and um, and we, if you translate the sequence, you actually get a protein that is composed of the six Ig-like domains that forms the extracellular domain of VEGF receptor 2. And it also has a unique C-terminus, which we exploited to make an antibody that was capable of detecting soluble VEGF receptor 2, but not VEGF receptor, the full-length VEGF receptor 2, which is shown here by this Western blot, the 75 kilodaltons band corresponding to soluble R2, but not the 230 kilodaltons band corresponding to membrane-bound VEGF receptor 2. So at this point, we were armed with tools to actually study the uh, spatial distribution of soluble VEGF receptor 2 and primarily in the cornea and in situ hybridization actually localize soluble VEGF receptor 2 to the cornea epithelium. Um, and we actually devised antibodies. That antibody that I showed you, we actually studied the uh, expression of soluble VEGF receptor 2 also spatially within the cornea and you can see that it's very highly expressed at birth. So this is P0. And then it's expressed throughout the entire corneal thickness. But then its expression becomes confined to the corneal epithelium. And if you look at the conjunctiva corneal interface, there is a very clear demarcation of s receptor 2 here shown in green in the corneal epithelium, but not in the conjunctiva. And you can also see for this corneal flat mount that it's very highly expressed in the limbal area of the cornea, but not at the central cornea, not as much, I should say. Um, so at this point, we were convinced that we had established the existence of a new receptor, but we had no idea what it actually did. Um, so I actually, in some preliminary studies, I showed that this receptor, soluble VEGF receptor 2, actually interacted with VEGFC, uh, physically interacted with VEGFC. And then I also showed that in, in vitro assays that it blocked VEGFC signaling. Hence, we hypothesized that this molecule would be anti-lymph angiogenic. Um, because it was so highly expressed at birth, then uh, we were interested in understanding what was its role in corneal development. And to do that, we created a mouse that was deficient in soluble VEGF receptor 2 in the cornea. And here is demonstration that these knockout mice, they do not have soluble R2 in the cornea compared to the wild type mice, which you can see the epithelium does express soluble R2. And these mice had a really an astonishing phenotype. These mice were born with their corneas spontaneously invaded by lymphatic vessels, here shown by this corneal flat mount, uh, which was very, uh, very um, astonishing phenotype. And it was very uh, powerful because uh, we were very excited about this because the blood vasculature was unchanged. And this was unprecedented because the two vasculatures are usually very well coupled. So we, for the first time, were, were, we were seeing uncoupling of these two vasculatures, which was unheard of. Um, but why was I really excited? Well, so um, it's well known that neovascularization in the cornea is a very negative predictor of transplant survival. And the theory is that the lymphatic system, actually here shown as the afferent pathway, actually works to drain antigens and antigen-presenting cells from the donor cornea that then migrate to the lymph node and activate the whole cascade of that ultimately leads to transplant rejection. So maybe by modulating this efferent pathway, you could actually impact the survival of corneal transplant. And this has never been really fully understood because the 
because these two vasculatures are coupled together, no one could ever really tell what was the, the particular role of lymphatic versus blood vessels in this context. So we, uh, to really move this project forward, we looked at what was the role of SR2 in repartive corneal injury, in, in, in repartive lymphangiogenesis. And we actually showed that in using the suture-induced uh, corneal angiogenesis assay by placing two 11 0 sutures in the mouse cornea, and given time, these blood vessels and lymphatic vessels would grow. So we actually showed that if I deleted soluble R2 from the cornea, as I did in the developing mouse, you have a drastic increase in the levels or in the density of lymphatic vessels in the cornea, but no change in blood vessels shown here in red. But you can see that there's a drastic increase in lymphangiogenesis. And then the opposite was also true. So if I overexpress soluble VEGF receptor 2 in the cornea, you saw a decrease in the levels of lymphangiogenesis, whereas the levels of blood vessel density was actually unchanged. So we're pretty convinced that we had now a tool to manipulate lymphatic vessels without really affecting blood vessels. Um, and the ultimate proof would be to actually show that if I treated corneas with soluble VEGF receptor 2 and block lymphatic vessels from growing into the grafts, that I would actually impact the survival of corneal allografts. And we use the mouse model of PKP. Um, and you can see here, this uh, is a, a Kaplan-Meier curve showing in the control group, you can see that at eight weeks post-transplant that there is actually a 40% survival compared to a group in which we injected soluble VEGF receptor 2 immediately before transplantation, which doubled the survival rate. Um, it was nearly uh, all of the cornea survived. So, um, and this was m even the more astonishing because this survival was accomplished even in the presence of blood vessels crossing through the interface between the graft and the donor, really implicating that lymphatic vessels are the key negative predictor of transplant rejection. Um, so I have really cherry-picked things from this paper that we published to be able to talk to you in the time um, that was allotted to me. But if you're interested, you can actually go ahead and, and read the full paper. It was published in Nature Medicine last, last year in uh, September. Um, and we actually got the cover. Uh, we're pretty excited about that. Um, so I will conclude uh, and summarize by telling you that uh, at soluble VEGFR2, I hope I showed you enough data to convince you that soluble VEGFR2 is a splicing variant of VEGF receptor 2, um, that soluble VEGF receptor 2 is the first reported endogenous specific inhibitor of lymphatic vessel growth, um, and also that soluble VEGFR2 works to um, aid in the creation of an alymphatic cornea and also that it inhibits reparative lymphangiogenesis and it enhances the survival of corneal transplants. Um, and uh, this, we've been moving this project forward and we're actually looking at Fuchs dystrophy. Uh, we, I actually found out yesterday, just got a paper accepted in which we're looking at cancer metastases. Uh, and there's a lot of other models in which you're exploiting this molecule uh, for other clinical applications. Um, I would, I'd like to acknowledge all of my lab um, um, friends and uh, our lab family, I, we call it. Um, these guys have been critical in, in helping me move this project forward. Uh, good science is not done without good collaboration, so I, I'd like to acknowledge all of these collaborators around the world. And the other thing that good science is not done without is money, so I need to acknowledge Fight for Sight, Research to Prevent Blindness, the MD-PhD program at the University of Kentucky, and uh, my biggest source of funding, which was uh, Jay Krishnambati, Bala's brother, uh, who really supported me financially and intellectually through this entire journey. Um, with that, I will entertain any questions. And uh, you guys, if you like horses, you should come to Kentucky. Thank you. <laughs> Sure. Actually, so the, the, when I talked about maybe exploiting it in Fuchs dystrophy, um, one of the ideas is that um, I've been looking at, we have a, a library of, uh, of corneas that I've been looking at, and it appears that Fuchs patients <coughs> have higher expression of soluble R2, uh, hence lymphatic vessels cannot grow into the cornea, but if it could actually make lymphatic vessels grow into the corneostoma, 
you then know there is endothelial dysfunction in edema, maybe we could prevent edema from forming with lymphatics coming to the flank. So this is an idea we are actually exploring. Um, any, other, any further questions? All right, thank you very much.